Right, so yeah, it was another beautiful Lord's Day, so thank God for that. It's good to be here in this beautiful evening, and uh, thank you so much for your time and dedication to the Lord's Church, and if you're visiting, we're, we're glad to have you too. So, obviously, the title of this sermon is, What is a Pastor? All right, this is a very important question, because there's been a lot of confusion for the last few centuries, centuries of confusion of what a pastor is right? Uh, I'm going to try to make this absolutely as clear as possible, not trying to go too deep. I know that usually on Sunday PMs we have deeper lessons and try to apply deeper things, spiritual things, but I was convicted to talk on this. There's 400, at least 400 churches in this town alone. Okay, so think about it. And when I have spiritual discussions with people, when I go out and talk to people, they use this language like my pastor, or I heard this pastor say this, my pastor taught me this, and it's heavily misused because what they think is a pastor isn't a pastor. See, the problem is, is actually, if you do your research, it's actually originated with John Calvin during the Reformation movement. John Calvin, Martin Luther, they were reformers, right? And Reformation isn't the same as restoration, you see? Reforming the Lord's church is not the same as restoring the Lord's church to the original. You know, one of my younger preacher friends, I like the way that he uses it. Instead of saying we're non-denominational, maybe we should say we're trying to be pre-denominational. You see? Based off the book of Acts in the New Testament. But see, John Calvin, he wanted to obviously shut down Catholicism, but he made the same mistakes. Instead of having a priest perform all the things and the duties over the congregation. He said, pastors should do that. So a single pastor was appointed to oversee the congregation and be the pre main preacher and main teacher and guider and the decision maker over the, all the people. That's wrong too, because that's not what a pastor is, you see. Uh, can a pastor preach and teach? Absolutely. A preacher and a teacher and evangelist can become a pastor if they're qualified, but often we don't see that's the case. Also, you've heard the language youth pastor. This is my youth pastor. He's 20 years old. Where did that come from? That's not in the scriptures, you see. When we talk about what a pastor is, first of all, Anglo-French, Latin, and German, that's where that word came from. But it really means shepherd. It's as simple as that, and I'm going to show you that as we go through the texts of the scriptures. It just means shepherd. And what's funny is, in, in the 1380s, it was Wycliffe, he translated the New Testament in English. He translated it shepherd in Ephesians 4.11. Okay? William Tyndall, in the 1530s, he also translated it shepherd. But the Geneva Bible and the King James Version wanted to beautify the text, so they throw in the word pastor which has caused much confusion in the last few centuries. But beyond that, right, it's not just about, oh yeah, let's, let's be right with the, the scriptures and all that stuff. Let me read you some statistics on the problems with the modern pastor, right? These come from a, a variety of different articles. 94% of pastors across the board of all denominations feel pressured to have an ideal family, right? I can't relate. I'm ha God gave me the family he wanted to give me, right? All right. <laughs> 90% work more than 46 hours a week. Oh, boo-hoo, whatever, right? 81% <laughs> say they have insufficient time with their spouses. That's not necessarily a pastoral problem. That can be a man problem, okay? 80% believe that the pastoral ministry affects their family negatively. That's not good. 70% do not have someone they consider a close friend. That's not good either, depending on your personality. 70% have lower self-esteem than when they entered the ministry. That's sad. 50% feel unable to meet the demands of the job. That's sad. 80% are discouraged or deal with depression. Not good. More than 40% report that they are suffering from burnout, frantic schedules, and unrealistic expectations. 33% consider pastoral ministry an outright hazard to the family. 33% have seriously considered leaving their position in the past year. 
40% of pastoral resignations are due to burnout. Most pastors are expected to juggle 16 major tasks at once, and many crumble under pressure. For this reason, 1,400 ministers in all denominations across the United States are fired or forced to resign each month. So it's not just, well, it's not just technicalities in the scriptures. You know, we're not just using technicalities of titles in the scriptures. We see that God's wisdom was correct. That if you try to call a preacher or an evangelist a pastor and dump everything on him, that is not what God intended. Because we see the disasters behind it. You see? Furthermore, when one thing's taught wrong and one thing's preached wrong, it's a slippery slope. Many things will be taught wrong eventually. Many ideas will come up and infiltrate. And then false doctrine is born. All right? So what is a pastor? Like I already told you. It's a shepherd. But it's more than that. Watch this. So f- four points. And they're, they're pretty short, so no worries, right? What is a pastor? A pastor is a shepherd. And we're going to look at Ephesians 4.11, which Jim read. Okay? Point number two, a pastor is an overseer, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Point number three, a pastor is an elder and an overseer, according to Titus chapter 1. And finally, number four, a pastor is an elder, overseer, and shepherd, according to Acts 20, verse 17, and then you jump down to verse 28, and 1 Peter chapter 5. So it's all these things. A pastor is an elder, an overseer, and a shepherd. They're all the same thing. All right, so let's go through this. So we started in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. I know that Jim read the context of Ephesians chapter 4, and this is important to understand too. So Ephesians 4, 11 in the New King James Version says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Since we're here, we may as well talk about these roles. Okay? Some to be apostles. They don't exist anymore. They died. He only appoint, Jesus only appointed 12 at a time, and the qualifications are found in Acts chapter 1. They had to be with Jesus, right, since the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry, and they had to be with Jesus during his death. No one can meet those qualifications anymore. They had to be a man, obviously, see? Unfortunately, we see people call themselves apostles today, and even women are calling themselves apostles today. How is that possible? Adding to the word, right? It's as simple as that. Some prophets, okay? When we talk about prophets, the prophets of old that prophesied about Jesus and the kingdom, the church, and everything that Jesus fulfilled through his death, building the church, yeah, that's Old Testament prophets. Later, there are a couple of prophets in the book of Acts that foresaw a couple things, but after that, if you research church history, honest, true church history, and you look at the flow of what things started to disappear in the first, second century, prophecy was one of them. This is so important to understand. Tongues was also one of them. Those things started to fade. You know, we often teach that it was because the apostles passed on gifts to other Christians, and they could do things, because they were the only ones that could pass on those gifts. And since the apostles died in the first century and second century Christians died. That's why we see the fading of those, those miracles that we do not see today. Very important to understand. However, prophecy, if we're going to talk about prophecy the way that we could use it now, it's simple. Intuition, discernment, counseling, stuff like that. Yeah, they're still gifts, but not the way that people like to say for, fortune telling or dreams of new visions of God and new revelation. If someone got new revelation... Even during this time in the first century, Paul would be like, hey, write it down, give it to me. Let's add it to the Bible, right? He didn't do that because that didn't happen. They didn't get new revelation all over the place. You see? So that's silly. So if that's the case back then, obviously we don't get new revelation now. You see? All right. Evangelist. That's what my role is. Right? I'm an evangelist. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist. Titus and Timothy were evangelists. First, Second Timothy and Titus are heavily misunderstood as pastoral books. No, they're books for evangelists, church planters, right? 
And let's talk about the pastors. Like I said, elder, overseer, shepherd. That's their role. And we're going to go over their role. They're going to, we're going to go over their qualifications. Pastors and teachers. I've heard from scholars that it's pastors slash teachers. And that makes sense because they're supposed to be able to teach. All right, so let's do this. So the Greek word for pastor is poimen. And look at the definition of it. Shepherd, right? Shepherd. Now, the English Standard Version, yay, they went back to the original, right? Translated into English, not German or Anglo, French or Latin. Let's put the English word in there. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. See? Shepherds. ESV says that. All right. Point number two. A pastor is an overseer. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And I'm, I'm using New King James right now just to make another sub-point. So 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, New King James. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, New King James, King James translates as bishop. This has also caused religious confusion, unfortunately. But it still means overseer. My New King James footnote here says, literally overseer. And it's like, why don't you just translate it overseer then, you know? <laughs> so it's overseer. But same thing, it's become like a political, religious figure in different churches, and that shouldn't have been the case. So it means overseer. But one thing we don't want to overlook is that if a man desires the position, you don't want to force a man to become an elder overseer shepherd, you see. They have to have that burning desire to serve the Lord in that capacity. So the New Testament Greek for that word, right, episcopus literally means overwatcher, overseer. That's what the Greek word means. So again, let's look at it in ESV. They translate it overseer. That this, the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Let's go to the next verses. Therefore, an overseer must be... Does that look like optional to you? The qualifications that we're about to read, do they look optional to you? What does the text say? It says an overseer must be, you see, not optional, a necessity. In Spanish it says necessi or something like that. We were studying in Spanish the other day, right? Necess I'm probably saying it wrong. <laughs> Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach or blameless. That doesn't mean perfect, but they've got to have a good reputation. See, the husband of one wife. So what does that tell you? That tells you that it must be a man, Right? Okay, it has to be a man. Because we also got women that are calling themselves pastoresses now. You see? What? This is the requirement, God's requirement to become a pastor, a shepherd, an overseer, an elder, is this. Husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. These are mandatory qualifications. When you look at it, it's like... You can't be like, impossible, nobody can do that. Really? No, I just, no. These are obviously possible. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't, command, wouldn't have commanded us and put this before us and say these are qualifications. They are realistic qualifications of a, of a Christian that loves the Lord and submits to the Lord. All right, verse 3. Not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. See? Pretty clear. Now, the not violent thing, see, that's why maybe I could never become an elder because after midnight, I put on my mask and my cape and I cleaned the streets up, right? <laughs> and then after I beat up the criminals, the next morning I knock on the door and say, hey, you want to come to church? No, I'm just kidding. It's, I know, ridiculous, right? <laughs> Verse 4. <laughs> Tristan is shaking his head and embarrassed. Verse 4, he must manage his, house, his own household well. He has to have children. With all dignity, keeping his children submissive. Okay, so he has to have children. Look what's going on here. Let's just stop right there. Hi, I'm, your, I'm the youth pastor, Jimmy. Right? And I, I just got out of college, and I don't, have, I don't have a wife or kids. But I'm your youth pastor. And then you got Elder Bob and Elder Maynard riding their bikes down the street in their white shirts. Ding, ding, ding. Hey, did you know there's a third book you never heard about in the Bible? <laughs> you know, my, my buddy Joseph Smith, 
had these holy goggles, and then he saw, had this new revelation. But, but I'm Elder Bob, and this is Elder Maynard. Fresh out of high school. You see? Not possible. <clears throat> Verse 5. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? This is a big deal. If he can't manage his own family and pour into his own family and lead them in instruction in the fear of the Lord, how can he lead God's church? Because what is God's church? It's family. It's God's family, you see? Verse 6, he must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. I, I knew this, this, he was an awesome man. Right? I, I don't really need to say his name, but he, he passed away some years ago. And he became an elder when he was 40. But he explained to me his mentality, how he was puffed up. He was prideful. And he, he kind of led the wrong way. Later down the road, he realized that. And it's just so cool that that, that older couple, they, they both passed from Arizona. But uh, that's the reality of it. What God says is true here. You see, if they're too young and they're too new, this is the trap they can fall into, you see, of becoming a real pastor. But let's go to verse 7. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. So that only makes sense. If they're in the workplace, and it's not wherever they work in the world, and like, well, that guy's lazy, that guy's pathetic, right? I can't trust him. He never shows up on time, never does his job. That doesn't make any sense for that kind of person to be a leader in the church, right? Must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. Same reason. All right, so that was point number two. Now, point number three. A pastor is an elder and an overseer, according to Titus chapter 1, starting in verse 5. So the Apostle Paul tells Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders, plural, this is a big deal. Because when we look all over the New Testament, it's a plurality of elders. Not one man has all the power, you see. And in God's wisdom, again, why does that make so much sense? Because not one man can be right all by himself. We have to check each other. We have, to hold, we have to hold each other accountable. We have to weigh the scriptures together and consider things together. One man cannot have that much power and authority over people. It was never meant to be that way. All right, so appoint elders in every town as I directed you. And this is not to be misunderstood either. Me and his evangelist is like, oh yeah, I get to appoint elders, right? Appoint, appoint, appoint. That's my decision. No, it's not. What that means is it's showing approval. You see, publicly showing approval that this man is qualified. And I have to be in agreement with the rest of the congregation that this man is qualified. You see, that's how it works. Verse 6 in Titus, chapter 1. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and look at this, and his children are believers. Some say faithful children. This translation says believers, so does New American Standard. So the children have to be believers. Interesting, you see. And not open to the charge of debauchery, or debauchery, if it pronounced different ways, or insubordination. Pretty big deal here, see. So consider these things. Verse 7, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach, blameless. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Verse 8, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Remember when we talk about holy? It means fully dedicated to God. You see, holy his. All right. Verse 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction and in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. That's right. You know, the, the elders at Tucson, <laughs> one of a, a, another elder, that he was an elder at the time, but he called the elders at the time, he called them silverbacks. Right? You know the silverback gorillas? 
<laughs> and sometimes they have to be silverbacks to stand up for the truth, right? And so do all of us. Actually, I heard an awesome story today about a, a godly woman that stood up for the truth. I don't need to say it right now, but yeah, it's, it's an awesome story. All right, verse four. I mean, point number four. A pastor is an elder, an overseer, and a shepherd. So when we look at Acts chapter 20, when Paul is giving his goodbye speech to the church of Ephesus, it tells us who he's talking to. Paul is talking to the elders from Ephesus. So in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. So he talks about all these different things, and then by the time he gets to verse 28, he says, he's talking to the elders, remember, he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock. That should already give you a dead giveaway that they're shepherds, but let's keep reading. Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So again, you connect verse 17 in Acts chapter 20, elders, Acts, uh, chapter 28, I mean, sorry, verse 28 in chapter 20, all three are there. See, elder, overseer, shepherd, they're all the same thing. Talking about the same role the same position, the same office. Also, let's not overlook if who is the one that actually makes them elders. It's the Holy Spirit that appoints elders. It's the Holy Spirit that makes them elders, you see? Very important to understand. Because when, you th when, when we think of, oh, you know, I, I wish he wasn't my elder, or I would never work for that elder, or why, am he, why is he that elder? You might want to think twice about that and have the attitude that David did towards Saul when he said, how dare you strike down the Lord's anointed? Okay? Be careful about respecting the authority of elders. All right, 1 Peter chapter 5. Another example of how a, a pastor is an elder, an overseer, and a shepherd. So this is New King James. 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 1. The elders who are among you, I exhort. This is Peter, remember. I, who am a fellow elder. Apparently, Peter was an elder too. Apparently, Peter met the qualifications. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. See the connection again? Verse 1, they're called elders. Verse 2, they're called shepherds and overseers. Elders, Overseers and shepherds are the same thing. See? And then let's not overlook these. Not by compulsion, not like, oh, I guess I'll lead because somebody asked me to or nobody's stepping up, right? No, you have to have that desire to serve God willingly. Not for dishonest gain. Unfortunately, many people enter leadership roles or ministry roles for selfish gain. That's, that's not right. That's sad. But it should never be so. Let's get verse 3 nor as being lords over those entrusted to you. So this is a big deal too. Remember, these are also qualifications. Ruling with an iron fist or ruling like Solomon, right? Even eventually, later, later in his time. Or Rehoboam, right? We don't want to do that. Christians should never do that. Fathers should never do that. Brothers should never do that. You see, lording over. Little... Baby sisters should never do that to their bigger brothers, right? Right? Little sisters should not lord over their bigger brothers. It's just not the Christian thing to do. All right. <laughs> All right, verse 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory. That does not fade away. And see, this is the promise, but these are the conditions. You've got to think about that that way. When we study the Old Testament promises, there's always these conditions attached. And it's like, okay, you, you're deciding to become an elder. You're deciding to become an overseer and a shepherd. You will be accountable for that. You see, you will be highly accountable for that. And if you don't meet what God requires of that, then guess what's the opposite of this promise? won't receive the crown of glory if you decide to do things your way and not God's way. You see? A big deal. All right, so again, like I said, I want to keep this as simple as possible so that anyone that hears it, because this will be online. What is a pastor? A pastor is a shepherd, 
a pastor is an overseer, a pastor is an elder and overseer, and a pastor is an elder, overseer, and shepherd. Not sure if that could be any more clear in the scriptures. It's pretty crystal clear, is it not? So next time you want to think about calling yourself a pastor or a youth pastor, you really want to consider these things. And also consider, are you actually part of the right group? Because the right group would stand up for God's word no matter what. Many congregations and many Christians say, or Bible believers, or people that say they have faith, they say that they love God with all their heart. They say that they love the Spirit. They say that they're Spirit-led in all these things. But you know what? The same people that have said that to me over and over again that I've had this study with, when they look at these qualifications, the response is, and literally I was studying with a pastor from the megachurch, their, their response is, that's just, he, those aren't qualifications. Those are things that are suggested. Those are just suggestions. Really? Okay. <laughs> that's, that's out of my hands. You have to answer to the Lord, you see? So, thank you so much for your time and attention, and I hope that you can use this information and guard this information and share it with as many people as you possibly can. So you have heard God's word. If you're here tonight, if you haven't committed to Jesus, do you believe God's word? Will you confess him as Lord? Will you turn away from your sins? Will you repent and turn to him? Will you be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and rise in newness of life? If you haven't done that, the baptistry is available. Many men are here willing to study with you to help you further understand these things. And if there's any need of the congregation at all, Please come forward and we stand and praise our Lord.